Serious group of financial advisors, John Everson and Phil McCoy on Winchester Avenue in Martinsburg. John Everson and Lisa Everson, so kind to offer me tickets to the uh, WVU pit game on Saturday, which I at the time could not accept for uh, work reasons, but uh, nice of them to offer. That was so nice of them. And uh, also Phil McCoy hangs out there as well. He's with us via telephone. Philip, good morning to you, sir. Good morning, guys. How are you all? Excellent. We appreciate your time this morning and all of your financial advice. Before we get to that, I need to talk about your Shepherd Rams, where Phil toiled as an offensive lineman back in the 90s. As a matter of fact, Long the time ago. very first Shepherd game I ever called, Phil was the starting offensive lineman. Jay Mason was the quarterback. And uh, and there was 300-pound tackle. Were you a guard or tackle, Phil? I don't remember. I was a tackle, but my last game I ever played, well, my first game and my last game I ever played, I was a guard. Okay. now, But I was a tackle for the rest of the time. Did Phil distinguish himself by being holding, offside, all those? <laughs> the Admiral just out to get people today. <laughs> just curious, Phil, just curious. <laughs> yes. Yes would be the answer to that. I, had, uh, I was probably the most penalized lineman we had. I, I would I would guess that, that would be a, a safe bet that I was Is the that most true? penalized. You think that's true, Phil? Yes. He's he's a very yes. humble man, Rob. <laughs> well I, I have to I have to admit like the, the first of all there's no such thing as holding. That's ridiculous. I, that's a ridiculous call. But I, I had my fair share of unsportsmanlike penalties, which Coach Cater I I, I aged him quite a bit the timing of my unsportsmanlike penalties. It was, it wasn't done out of, uh, it was, I didn't always hear the whistle. That's the best way I can put it. I did not always hear the whistle. Phil, let me, let me ask you this now, 30 years ago, you know, there's a lot of talking that goes on in football now. Was there as much talking then 30 years ago down on the field? Uh, yeah. I mean, there, there was, there's a fair amount. Some just never said anything. But uh, you know, I didn't. I didn't talk a lot. But the ones that did, that's normally where I got in trouble. They baited me, and it and it, it, sometimes it worked. But the uh, yeah, those those a lot of talk. But you didn't know as much about each other back then as what you do now. So because now because of social media, those guys know each other. They can look you up. They can find out your family's name, your girlfriend's name, your mother's <laughs> name. And then that you really couldn't do that. You just kind of knew where they were from, and that was it. Yeah, if you were doing that back then, you could get arrested for stalking or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Phil, Phil, you said they baited you. Was there a particular hot button issue that they used? They called him a bad financial advisor <laughs> to be, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was just it was just mouth and the uh, and I I shouldn't overstate it. I had maybe two or three unsportsmanlike <laughs> penalties <laughs> in my day, but the. Uh, and two of them came in the same game, and that was that was dangerous back then. Technically, I wasn't supposed to play my last game I ever had because I had two to get two unsportsmanlike penalties the game before. And I remember getting pulled out of the game in the fourth quarter after the second one, and I thought, oh, no, I'm not going to get to play my very last game. Somehow I got to play, and I, I, did, I just kept my mouth shut. So maybe uh, they, they – they called it something else and said, "Tell this idiot not to come back into the game." But the uh, but I I did get to play. But it was no, there was nothing in particular. I remember there was one that um, Fairmont that we and and we had a really good, really really good offensive game. But one of the rush edges was good friends with another guy on my team, and it was the other guy on my team, Jason Larue who annoyed me all week long about how good this guy was. And I took it pretty, made me mad. I was like, this guy's on my team. I don't hear about how great this guy is. And I was so lathered up, so that guy couldn't even open his mouth. And I hit him after the whistle on third and goal. And that didn't go over well at all. Cause we ended up at like, it was like third and 16. We ended up scoring, but, boy, Coach Cater was not happy at all. Who, who was your old line coach when you were there? It was, uh, for the most part, it was Greg Boyce. So when I first started, it was Jack Lent, who played in the NFL. Uh, he later moved to IUP. Um, and then he actually just passed away maybe five, six years ago in a mm -hmm. motorcycle accident. But then Greg Boyce came after that and ended up being our offensive coordinator as well. And he left. And when he left, I think that's when Ernie McCook came in. I think. 
There may have been someone in between there, but I'm pretty sure it was Ernie. Ernie came in after Coach Boyce left. Well, Cam Dorner from Oakdale, my school there, where I coach, he just went off on Saturday, nine catches, two receptions for touchdowns, and a 96-yard kickoff return in Shepherd's win. He was uh, quite dynamic. I know people were concerned about uh, maybe not enough playmakers coming back this year for Shepard, but I was not because I saw this kid for four years in high school, and he's a player. I was proud of him. He's 3-0 after all that they've lost. You know, you have two guys on NFL rosters, one that may end up on another NFL roster at some point, and, you know, they had the receiver that transferred. So you really thought that, like, oh, boy, they may have a down year. But so far, they're 3-0, and and I'm, I'm proud of them, man. That's, uh, that, I think that's huge. They don't – they're they're reloading. They're not rebuilding. So that's, uh, you said that this morning. So good, great for the Shepherd Rams. I see to be a Shepherd Ram. Dylan's got his headphones on in there. Dylan was at the game on Saturday. Deep. Yeah, Cam Dorner has got 325 receiving yards through t- his two games since he, he missed the first game, mm-hmm. which if they counted it right in the NCAA uh, website res- uh, page would be good enough for the most in the country per game. Right. And it's good for 10th overall, though, even though he missed the first game of the season. Yeah, he's been making some plays. And uh, the quarterback transfer, people were a little concerned about him in the offense in the first game where they looked a little clunky, but uh, they've been putting up some points since then. So they got it rolling there. Phil, let's talk uh, Steelers-Browns Monday night football. Uh, what are you expecting out of this? Because uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the Steelers lost this one. 1916, is it, Phil? 19 to 16. <laughs> I got to go back to 1916. I said, you know what? They've got a better offense this year. So I was going to give them two more points a game. And lo and behold, I do that and they lose. I'm convinced that my prediction of 21 to 17 – against the 49ers caused that blowout. I'm going back to 19 to 16. I hope that they're not as bad as they were against the San Francisco 49ers. They've got you know, the Browns are a bus all man. I mean, they look what they did to the Bengals and and now you could start off 0 and 2 in that division the way the Ravens look. This is a really important game. I hope I can stay up to watch it though. I'm aging. I don't know I can sit up that late and 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 watch that game, but I, they they need to win this game. If they if they're going to have any uh, well, they'd still have a hope, but it, it's going to be awfully difficult to pull out of a 0 and 2 hole, especially with a uh, division loss. Two home games. If they start off 0 and 2, that's going to be tough. Bengals are 0 and 2. Washington 2 and 0. They got a, a heck of a win yesterday. Uh, talk about that. They were down uh, what 20 20 to 3, 21 3. 21 3. And then uh, they they're up. They give up a hail mary at the end of the game, and then survive the two point conversion to hold on for the win there. So. Uh, pretty crazy for Washington. But let's talk uh, finances here, Phil, because the Fed's going to make a decision on interest rate hikes uh, this week. Yes, big Wednesday. And that uh, it's, it's, I think it's pretty much set in stone. I don't know if it's safe to say set in stone, but they're probably not going to increase rates uh, this week, but it's going to be their forward-looking guidance. The question really isn't now, Will they or won't they increase rates? You know, there's a small question. Will there be another rate increase later this year? And the odds are likely that there will be one more rate increase. But the bigger question for a market is how long will we keep rates this high? So that leads us to when when will there start to be a cut? And that's when the bad news, good news thing starts to come along for our markets anyway. Our employment numbers are too strong right now at the moment our employment numbers are too strong to even consider cutting rates why would you if you're still battling inflation and employment numbers uh, by the way they gauge them anyway look really good and wages are are up and and everything looks healthy there's still jobs to be had why would you then cut rates to spur on the economy when we still haven't gotten down to that target that they reiterated uh the two percent target john had brought up which i thought was a, a brilliant statement What's to keep them just from saying, hey, we're good at two and a half? Well, at at Jackson Hole, which was part of the reason why our September has been kind of slow, was Drone Powell reiterated, no, we mean 2%. We're going to get down to 2%. So that leads us to higher rates for longer. But how long? And that's something that we just don't know. That's going to be data dependent, what we have been for quite some time. Kind of boring, and I think it's getting long in the tooth and tired of talking about it. But it is kind of the most important thing that we have going on in our markets right now is the path of the Federal Reserve. We're getting to the tipping point, though, of, with the high rate environment. But how long will it be there? And so we'll, we'll learn some of that or get at least 
some direction by their tone. He won't say too many words that you could just definitively, you know, oh, yeah, we're going to start cutting rates in March. And that won't be the case, but his tone uh, and how he says things. Remember, our economy is going to experience some pain. He said that in August of 2022, and it led to a terrible August and the rest of September, and that was just tone. So what kind of tone will they have on Wednesday is the most important thing. Oil prices are now near $92 a barrel, following a gain of one and a quarter percent to this point this morning. We've got uh, the UAW auto strikes that uh, could turn larger and uh, more disruptive. And, of course, we've got the Fed and what they're doing with interest rates, Bill. Yet uh, things still aren't terrible for the economy. Yet, although, no, although I, no, I not, not at all. I, I do yeah. wonder how much longer these pressures can continue to mount without it eventually tanking it. Well, look at the oil prices, and last week was a great example of this with the CPI and the PPI. And they have two different readings. One is headline, and one is core. Uh, the core is what moved, or is what was the most important. Core is stripping out the uh, the price of oil and the more volatile food. And so they'll strip that stuff out and say, and I hate to use this word, but say, hey, that's transitory. It happens during the travel season. And there's been some discussion of even funflation. That was a cool word that I saw. Funflation because of all the concerts and all the cool, the Barbie movie and the Oppenheimer movie that had a cool little name because people were seeing them both at the same time. And, and uh, uh, Taylor Swift and... George Strait and Chris Stapleton. So people were going to in-person places this summer at an abundance, and it caused some funflation. I thought that was kind of neat. I don't know if I buy into it, but I thought it was a cool word. But, however, what what their focus has been on is the uh, the core inflation instead of the headline inflation. So as of right now, we've kind of blown off the price of oil. So, hey, this happens every summer. It's going to go up, and it's going to come back down when people start to – to slow down again. So that was what our focus was on. Now, the headlines may have said the headline inflation is up from, uh, I think it was, went from 3.2 to 3.6, I think, uh, last last month. But the core inflation fell a little bit, and that's kind of, we, we popped up a little bit on Wednesday because of that. So th- that is interesting to watch, and when will those gas prices roll over, and how long can we expect that to happen? But the first thing, the gas prices impact is food is the first thing it impacts. Eventually, it will make its way into our clothing and everything else. But right now, it just it's impacting food. That's why they have the two separate readings. Got my four and a half dollar box of cereal at the supermarket the other day. I opened it up; it was half air, Phil. <laughs> You're supposed to be eating that stuff anyway, Rob. You need oatmeal and bananas and, and better for you sort of things in the morning. Not that cold cereal, man. That stuff will hurt you. It was an oat-based cereal. Does that help? <laughs> oh, yeah. It was oat yeah, I guess it does. Hey, 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 when it's half air, it ain't hurt me. <laughs> Nothing hurt me was financially. Yeah. I was, I was so sad when I opened it up. It was like, oh, this is a good amount of cereal for this price. It was half, half air. That is called shrinkflation. We could put that. We could put flation at the end of everything. Funflation, shrinkflation. Yeah. Well, they sh- shrinkflation is what you see in your food. You see, they keep the same price, however, give you less of it. And you know the problem with that is. And when prices subside, they don't go back and give you more. Mm-hmm. It's not often that that happens. So that price is like, hey, we didn't increase your price. Now you just cut our food in half. But that, that's how they do that. It's called shrinkflation. And that has been a problem for quite some time. They should shrink the box in the plastic and save the air. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Go ahead, Bill. But they've already got those boxes to, to produce it. Right? They've already got the big boxes. So they're not going to get rid of those. So they just give you less. Yeah. Phil, while you were talking about your unsportsmanlike penalty, our colleague John <laughs> Gilstrap was going through whole, uh, reams and reams of financial data. So he has numerous hard questions. I could filibuster and protect you from these hard questions, but I'm going to just throw you to the wolves. Go ahead, John. <laughs> wow. What, what a setup right there, huh? You're a wolf. Um, a very interesting article in the, in the Wall Street Journal this morning. The, the title is Why a soft, soft Landing Can Prove Elusive. And I'm just going to quote, I'm not going to read the whole article, but quoting from here. Since World War II, economists say, the United States has achieved only one durable soft landing, and that was in 1995. According to Alan Blinder, an economist who is uh, Fed vice chair from 94 to 96, he said, 
We steered the economy very expertly, but in addition, we were lucky. Nothing bad happened. And they list, you know, if the Fed stays too tight for too long, the economy stays too hot for too long, the energy prices take off or financial uh, market mishap happens. The, the context of this article, as I understand it, is that this is all, um, the Fed has a unique opportunity to snatch defeat from victory here if they stay too too long before they start cutting rates in in the face of all that's happening what do you think um, i agree and the key word i think you said in there was incredibly lucky and it is going to require some sort of luck especially once we get down to if we uh, i'm assuming we're going to get down to that inflation they reiterated it last last month but if we, once we get down to that two percent inflation and rates are high and then we start to see stress on the economy they have that tool in their tool belt that they can decrease rates. It's always my fear when rates are extremely low and you have nowhere to go in the event of a tragedy or something, a tragic market event, that you've got nowhere to go to spur the economy on as it pertains to rates. Uh, if you remember uh, uh, the, the checks that we got in the mail for the very first time, I remember I, I had just bought a home. And we got an $1,800 check. I think we bought a refrigerator with it. But most people didn't spend that. Well, they did that because they didn't really have anywhere to go with rates. we got to spur these people on somehow. So they just sent people checks. We did that during COVID. Uh, they just sent people checks to spur us on. But once rates are high, they do have that tool in their toolbox. But we have to be down to that inflation target before they start cutting rates. So that's where our danger is. Rates are high. We're not down to our target inflation quite yet and then something tragic happens tragic in the eyes of the market something tragic tragic happens now a lot of people are fearful that this uaw strike could could be just that i don't know that i have that same fear uh with this uaw strike quite honestly i think that part uh, of this ne the next upcoming narrative is going to be the uaw strike i don't think that it has the teeth to impact the overall market Individual companies, yes. GM and Ford, ultimately, at the end of the day, whatever resolution is going to come, that resolution is going to mean less profits for those companies. And I'm not taking a side on a strike, but from the standpoint of the stock price, you're already facing great pressure to transition to the EV world. You know, what, who really stands to enjoy from that is the existing EV companies that have already done that, Tesla in particular. But you got GM and Ford, it's losing billions of dollars just to transition from gas to EV, and they're using the profits from their gas motors to fund the transition to EV, and now they've got these these 40% requests for pay increases in less hours per week, and that puts even more pressure on their profitability. However, because of the popularity of the EV makers like Tesla and then you have Honda and Toyota and Volvo and all these other automakers that are all across the country, uh, and in particular down south. I heard Tim Scott talking about uh, some of the ones that they brought in that they wouldn't bring in the union automakers. They would only bring in the non-union automakers, but the uh, according to what he said anyway. But those companies stand to profit from it. So it's not as if the auto market would completely fall apart like it may have done in the 90s if GM and Ford weren't making vehicles, and Chrysler, whatever they call themselves now, if they weren't making vehicles any longer because of the popularity of Hondas and Toyotas and, and Teslas and all the other options that we have have now. I just don't know that, that the big three has the teeth to impact the overall economy, but the individual uh, companies could struggle mightily, and certainly we, we already know this. At the end of this strike, and it will come to an end eventually, eventually, whatever agreement they're coming up with, their profitability is going to shrink. Now, does that find its way through to the price of the autos? Uh, probably at some point, and it may inhibit their transition over to the electric vehicles. So I don't know that that's going to be the next tragedy that needs to be avoided um, in our economy, but if we can avoid those sort of things, it's more, people are talking more and more and our belief more and more is that we can accomplish the soft landing. Now, the second part to that is, John, you said durable soft landing, which means long standing. Oh, yeah, we didn't go into a recession and we got inflation down. Well, how long does that last? 
And as long as the rates are high, and that's why a lot of us, including myself, think that they're going to keep rates higher longer because if they cut rates without an, with, without a pro- provocation, if there's no reason to cut rates either uh, other than to make us smile, then then where do we go once we do run into a tragic economic event? So that durability of the soft landing will then be the next question. Eventually we will go into a recession, but it doesn't have to be because of the, of, of our actions to slow inflation right now. See, here's my concern about the strikes, <clears throat> the, the fact that it's all three of the, the big automakers at the same time. There are whole communities it's not just whether or not the price of cars goes up or down or if employees get more pay or they don't. There are entire communities that are built around these these factories. And if the, the strike runs long, which, you know, if if any if the West Coast strikes are any indication, strikes are running long these days, we're looking at bodegas and, and uh, mom and pop shops, them all going out of business and or certainly struggling. And the economy... You know, it, it's a weird thing as I look at it. The economy is really based on confidence and people's people's beliefs that things are going to get better. If this injects that feeling of doom, and we are coming into an election year, and doom is what sells, you know, for votes. You know, I uh, this is concerning to me. I, I I I'm not as hopeful as you are. I don't think. Uh, for the small pockets of it, and, and let's look at maybe what that has to do with the Fed and the next increase. You know, they're, the Fed is kind of looking for help. Give us a reason to slow the consumer down right now at this moment. Give us a reason to slow the consumer down. And if those strikes do that, it could. It has the potential to prevent the next rate increase if uh, if it does slow the consumer down just on a consumer confidence level. Because that's one of those measures that they're paying attention to, how confident are our consumers and if our consumers aren't as confident because of the auto strike, it may do some of the Fed's job for it. It just depends on, like you had just said, the duration of the of these strikes and, and and how long they they could potentially go on. But what we do know is that moving forward, whatever resolution they come up with, it is going even if it's for a brief period, it is going to impact the uh, the stock price of those big three. Phil, why don't we pick up on what was mentioned a couple, three weeks ago with John. Uh, just uh, declare victory and say we have reached our goal, and our goal is 2.5% inflation, and then just go forward. I, I, I don't disagree at all, and I don't know why that's not on the table. They said it wasn't on the table at Jackson Hole. They've made a huge strides in lowering or slowing inflation, and to just say, hey, that was our target. I think it was in 2018. That was our target the last time we were in. We were uh, increasing rates. Is our target was two and a half percent. So why now two percent and such a hard line on that? I'd love to hear him at this next meeting suggest that maybe that two percent could be. You know, if we get close to two percent, because I think that's more reasonable uh, than. than to just say, hey, it's a hard line. We've got to get to two percent. I think two and a half percent would be more reasonable to do so. If you get to two percent, then great. But if you don't, you know, as Rob would put it, stop this war on the American consumer yes. uh, with your rate increases. Phil, please pronounce T E S L A for me. <laughs> How do you pronounce it? Tesla. Tesla. <laughs> Thank you. You said it. I've been picking on him all morning, Phil. That's why he's getting back at me. You said it incorrectly three times. Count. You said it. You said it wrong three times in a row. T e s l a. Tesla. Everyone knows that. Phil, how do we reach you for more information today? You, you can reach us at three zero four two six three four three four three, or stop by and see us with an appointment at twelve seventy Winchester Avenue, right here, in Martinsburg. Thank you, Philip. Have a great day. Thank you, guys. Have a great week.